What's the nature of your emergency? Welcome back to the Tactical Living Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Walton, joined by Detective Walton. Glenn, how are you? I'm good. Today is currently Sunday, August the 20th, and we're sitting up in the studio listening to, I think, the remnants of Hurricane Hillary, because um, we're in a tropical storm, which might sound so normal to most people. But the thing that I believe a lot of people don't understand when you live in Southern California, we don't have a lot of weather systems that come in. So when we do, they're incredibly unpredictable. And that also creates a lot of excitement. Mm -hmm. You know, we've lived here our entire lives and it's exciting to just anticipate what could happen and waiting to see if there's going to be thunderstorms and, you know, to just have, have weather to be able to experience because we don't always get to. I mean, it, the the perk for California is the weather's always so nice, and and that's why when there's a severe change like this, we get excited over it. But then there's so much negativity surrounding it too. Like people joke that when it rains, like all of California turns into a nightmare, and it's just something that <laughs> we we aren't prepared for all the time. Yeah, for sure. So you'll be listening to this. I'll post this episode on September the 6th, and you will have known whether or not we have floated away. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Another thing, too, though, is one of my biggest fears is earthquakes. And so the I've seen experts say, like, there is no indication that weather like this has an implication on increased levels of earthquakes. But when you I feel like your your sense of awareness when you've lived in a in the same environment for a long period of time, you you get a different sense, right? So for me, I feel like the variance in the temperature, first of all, has a dramatic impact on just the expansion or collapse of our soil, right? Um, so yeah, well, I guess we'll see what happens with that. I've also heard a lot of the conspiracy theorists talk about things that might take place in September. And there's just a lot of confusion, I think, happening in the world right now. Um, So yeah, we'll see what happens. But today I've titled the episode Survival Mode and Beyond, Addressing the Unseen Traumas in Policing. So just sit back, relax, and enjoy today's content. There is an incredible book I suggest we all read. It's called Waking the Tiger, Healing Trauma. I'll link it down in the show notes below. But I wanted to read a little bit from this book for you because I think it's incredibly impactful for us to just be able to understand trauma. And here it says... Trauma is perhaps the most avoided, ignored, belittled, denied, and misunderstood cause of human suffering. We enter this altered state, let us call it survival mode, when we perceive that our lives are being threatened. If we are overwhelmed by the threat and are unable to successfully defend ourselves, we can become stuck in survival mode. This highly aroused state is designed solely to enable short-term defensive actions, but left untreated over time, It becomes to form the symptoms of trauma. These symptoms can invade every aspect of our lives. Hmm. And it's, it's so true. Like, you know, and it's that hypersensitivity associated to that fight or flight response and, and dealing with like working for such a busy agency, like you, you, on a daily basis are exposed to very high priority calls for service, like man with a gun, shooting, stabbings, all that, all the stuff that agencies across the nation, I mean, there are busy agencies, but for the most part, they're not exposed to that all the time to where if you're constantly being involved in those types of situations and you're, you're always going to have this hypersensitivity even when you're off. Yeah, and here's the thing I don't think a lot of people understand, something that that kind of aids into the whole stigma behind mental health. So if you're going on to these repetitive calls, like what you're talking about, cognitively, you very well are able to handle them. But on a chemical level, something else is taking place within you, even if you don't realize that it's happening. And an easy way to give an example of this is, 
on a primitive level, if we had to go out and hunt and gather, then you might come across an animal that you want to be able to take home to your family. And so that heightened state of fight or flight, that being it's either going to be the animal or the animal's going to get me, you know, how, how infrequent of an activity is that? Right. Yeah. There would be times when you, you would get giant game on purpose to be able to have for days on it on end. And then you compare that to a situation of responding to these calls or uh, let's say a firefighter going to call after call after call of devastation and loss of life, loss of property and things like that. So you might be able to handle it, you know, on the surface level cognitively. But chemically, if something is taking place within you that is altering your state of being because that fight or flight is kicking on and in such an enhanced state. That's why the, the levels of stress are so prevalent in these types, these types of professions. And also the self-medication and, and the, the under-recognition under of these responses that where you go home and I need a beer, I need a drink, I need whatever it may be. And, and it's such an unhealthy way of living with that. And it's, it's a depressant. So it brings that to the forefront even more. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad that you said that because I've outlined why recognizing this and addressing this is so critical. And one thing that I put on here is performance and decision-making Um, officers operating under these sustained survival modes all the time might find that their decision-making skills are impaired and this could potentially affect performance and judgment in critical situations. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's going to bring to light that you're not going to treat each situation as its own compared to if you're going to them on a regular basis and say nine times out of 10, they've all worked out this one way, you're going to assume it's going to work out that same way again. Un, I, I would say what's like in the back of your mind. And so you're going to approach it that way, even though as you're going through that incident, you're it's, it's not panning out that way. Yeah. And a big one that I put on here is, of course, mental health. So prolonged exposure to trauma without treatment can, of course, lead to things like anxiety, depression, um, PTSD, and a, a myriad of other mental health issues. And then, of course, personal relationships. So when you're stuck constantly in this state of alert, it's going to cause strain on your personal relationships. And that could lead to detachment and, I think, a heightened state of conflict. I believe that's why a lot of people think that first responders have such a difficult time when it comes to um, maintaining and sustaining a relationship. And I, I often try to correct people when they say that first responders, police in particular, have a higher divorce rate than any other profession. If, if you look up real statistics, it's actually not true. Um, it's, it ebbs and flows but it's actually the latest that I've seen is lower than the national average. So what what all of that says is it there are many stressful jobs that could also increase these chemicals in our bodies, not just being a first responder. And if you don't have the proper tools to be able to navigate through that, it's going to continue to cause an implication on your physical well-being. So your overall health, chronic stress and trauma can manifest in a lot of different physical ailments. There's heart conditions, insomnia, like the list will go on and on and on. And that's why I think it's so important for everybody to be aware, right? That's the first step. But then also recognizing the signs and reaching out for help when you need it. There are more resources now than there ever have been before for police in particular. um, If you realize that just something isn't feeling quite right. Yeah, it's it's. If, when you recognize that for yourself, you know, seek that help, seek the different avenues, you know, reach out to someone who you feel comfortable in talking with and indicate those signs. Like it's so important to do it. It's if you don't have that support system at home, like find someone that you feel comfortable in speaking with. Yeah. And I think that now more than ever, it's important for us to make sure that our protectors are protected. And there are confidential ways to be able to do that. And I know that that's one of the biggest pushbacks for a police officer is not wanting to have that clinical trail following you. Um, You know, we know that despite HIPAA laws, 
there are oftentimes ways around that, especially if there's like an OIS involved and then you end up in court, right? That can, and we have seen oftentimes does go out the window. And that's the reason why people don't seek out counsel. You know, that's the reason why they don't ask for help. But there are other um, avenues if that's not the the one that you want to go down that are truly confidential ones where you don't even have to provide who you are, you yeah. know? Um, so I, I think that it's a, there's no reason to have an excuse anymore. I hope you've gotten some value out of today's episode. If you have, do us a favor, drop a review, subscribe down below. And as always, know that I'm sending you a long, tight hug from my home to yours.